everybody. Welcome to Echo Online Week 2. First off, let me just say a huge thank you to all you leaders and students that took part last week. We had a ton of people online, and I know there were some hiccups with Zoom and getting people on, but you guys managed it, and it was awesome, and ministry continued without a blip. So thank you so much for being a part of it, and thanks for hopping on for Echo Online Week 2. Hope you enjoyed the trivia game. Uh, we're going to get into this stuff pretty much right away. I have a couple announcements, and then we're going to dig right in to our last week with a walk with Christ to the cross. First announcement is this. Next week, there will be no Echo Online on Wednesday. We're really encouraging you guys, students, to participate in the Monday Thursday service, which will be online um, on YouTube, our YouTube channel, uh, at 7 o'clock on next Thursday, Monday Thursday. And this is what we've been talking about, a walk with Christ to the cross. Next week is Holy Week. Uh, Monday Thursday starts off right where we started with our curriculum with Jesus meet with his disciples in the upper room. And uh, and so that's, that's what we'll be talking about. I'll be preaching. I'll be giving the message that night. So please hop on, be a part of that, be engaged with that. Uh, but there's no Wednesday night journey groups uh, or Echo Online that are scheduled. If you as a journey group want to get together and meet, man, I encourage that. Go for it. Do it. Schedule your own Zoom meeting and meet. Please do so. But there will be no programming like this for next week. Okay? Uh, that's, what the, that's really the only announcement I got for you, except for just be a part of the services next week of Holy Week. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Uh, Sheldon will be back sharing his testimony again on that, uh, that worship service online. So come on, check him out and support him. Uh, my wife also will be too, so come out and support her too. Uh, and then, of course, Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection and life of Jesus. So be a part of, of those services whether that be with you or hopefully with your family. So, cool? Sounds good. Well, before we get into this, this is some heavy-duty stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Let me pray and let's get into it. Lord God, I thank you so much for these leaders and students who are online right now, Lord, and watching this. And Lord, we have come through this crazy journey with you as you have uh, got, uh, have done this journey of, of walking to the cross. And walking it with you, Lord, has been heartbreaking. Uh, it's been eye-opening. And Lord, I pray that uh, this evening as we come to our last one where we look at the crucifixion, Lord, it's it's bloody, it's painful, it's hurtful, it's, it's ugly to look at and even talk about, but it's the truth of what you went through. So Lord, let that seep into us, that this is the truth of what you went through for each and every single one of us. Open our hearts and mind, let the technology work and help us to be engaged. In your name we pray, amen. Well, last week we left off with Jesus being condemned to die by the Roman governor Pilate. Now, it's a couple of things that are important to remember before we start getting to the cross, that before Jesus had him condemned to die, or before Pilate had Jesus condemned to die, he had Jesus flogged and beaten. Because remember, Pilate didn't really want Jesus to die. He didn't want to kill Jesus. He didn't want to be responsible for that. Not because he cared for Jesus, but because he didn't want any news to get back to Caesar uh, that there was this huge upheaval in Jerusalem where he was the governor and he was in charge. So he didn't want any of that to happen. Uh, so he did not want to put this man to death. So he had him beaten and flogged. Uh, and this is where extreme pain came into Jesus' life. He was physically beaten. People punched him, kicked him. But when he had him flogged, what flogging was, uh, and this is pretty gruesome stuff, but it's what, what the Bible talks about is that it was, he was whipped with a thing called the cat of nine tails. And what that was, it was a stick. And uh, uh, attached to the stick were nine pieces of leather, leather straps coming off of this stick. And at the end of each of these nine leather straps, um, they would put a piece of metal, a piece of steel, or more likely a piece of bone. And Jesus was beaten with this thing. And so what would happen is this thing would hit Jesus, but the bone or metal would stick to his flesh and be ripped off his body. With each hit, the Bible tells us that Jesus was unrecognizable after this beating took place. And it was so bad that when he came back to the courts, everyone kind of just kind of paused and held their breath. And Pilate, seeing how bad Jesus had been beaten, thought for sure that this would be enough to appease uh, the Sadducees and the people begging for him to be crucified. And so Pilate presented Jesus, all beaten, all bloody, unrecognizable, and said, is this enough? 
Is, have we done enough to this Jesus guy? Are, are you okay? Can we, can we be done with this killing of Jesus thing? And they continue to yell, no, crucify him, crucify him. So finally Pilate says, I wash my hands of this and you can go. So they take him on the road to a place called Golgotha to be crucified. So this is where we pick it up. We pick it up from Luke chapter 23, which we've been in all, all these weeks, uh, starting at verse 26 through 43. So it's a bit long, so please pay attention. This stuff is important, okay? Starting at verse 26. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be, be, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. They did this because Jesus could not physically carry his cross. You see, the Romans, when they crucified people from, the, from Pilate's palace, they would make the person carry the wooden cross all the way to Golgotha. And Jesus had been beaten unrecognizably so that he physically could not carry that cross. And I'll talk more about that in a second too. So they got this guy, Simon, just pulled him out of the crowd to have him carry it. A large crowd trailed behind him, including many Greek-stricken women. But Jesus turned to them and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that are not born, a child, and the breasts that have not nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? It's a pretty intense statement by Jesus, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But I find it, I found it crazy that he still has the strength to speak while walking. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to the place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on the right side and one on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. So a lot's going on there, and I want to unpack it a little bit. So like I said, Jesus had to carry his own cross from Pilate's, Pilate's palace all the way to this place called Galgatha, which means the skull. And before I go any further, I want to say this. I have been to Israel, and I've had the opportunity to go on these tours. Guys, when we read this stuff and we read about these places, these are real places you can go today. It's called Golgotha, and it's this big mountainside in Jerusalem. And it's called that because when you're standing down and looking up at the mountain, you can see what looks like a skull on the mountainside. The way that the hills is shaped, it looks like a big skull. And so that's where they would crucify people. And so Jesus would carry, carry his cross. He's too weak. He can't go on. This guy Simon picks it up and carries it the rest of the way. And this is where they... Get him on the cross. I want to talk a little bit about what that meant. We all know that he was nailed to the cross, one in each hand and one in his feet. But it's a little bit more than that, okay? Jesus would have been nailed uh, to the cross through his wrists and through, bo and through his, the top of his feet. Now, it's not through his hands like we often hear. It would be through the wrist, and it would be done very precisely not to hit any major arteries. They would put the stake almost between the arteries and pound it through one on each side. And then they would take a stake to his feet. But first what they would do is they would bend his legs, bend his knees to make sure he could that the knees were bent, and then they would pound a nail through his feet. And this was done because it was a very painful experience once the cross had been put up 
he would be able to, they would lift themselves up because their knees are bent. So in order for them to breathe, they would lift themselves up, taking all the weight off their chest and their lungs, which enabled them to breathe. Can you imagine the pain that that person went through having nails in their feet lifting up? So that's how they crucified him on the cross. Jesus has been through the ringer already. Obviously, this is extremely painful. But what happened next probably put Jesus' body through an immense amount of pain and shock. You see, the cross wasn't in the ground yet. A hole was dug about three or four feet deep. And that cross was lifted up by these Roman guards and pushed down this hole. Now, if you can imagine, the cross weighed around 160 pounds without Jesus on it. Okay? So you can imagine 160 pounds going three to four feet deep, hitting hard. And someone is nailed to the cross when that hits the earth. His whole body would have just jerked. And the amount of pain that he must have felt was unbearable. And there he is. Jesus is on the cross. And the Bible tells us that there's two other criminals that are hung or crucified next to him. One on his left, one on his right. And one of these criminals are mocking him, saying, If you really are the king, save you, save us. Come on, man. He's mocking Jesus. But the other one, he says, Man, you're nuts. He says, we deserve our punishment. You and me, we deserve to be here, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns and looks at Jesus and says, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, truly I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. The amount of pain that Jesus went through during this crucifixion part, I don't don't go too far into the details of really how bloody and gory it is, because I think we understand that, we know that, and we've seen the pain already that Jesus has been through, and this is like mountaintop experience of pain. And here he is, and he has the strength to turn and look at a criminal and say, today you will be with me in paradise. Not only that, Scripture tells us that he says these words, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Now Jesus wasn't really speaking to the criminals at the time, he was speaking to the people who were crucifying. He was speaking to the guards who were nailing the nails and putting the cross in the hole. He was saying, Father, forgive them. This is really important because Jesus just isn't dying for those who believe. Jesus is not dying for just those who believe in him and who worship him, but he is dying for every single person. That's important because we often ask questions like, what about What happens to people when they die if they believe in other religions? What happens if people die who don't know Jesus? Well, the fact of it is, is Jesus died for them too. Just as he did for us who believe, he died for everyone. So Jesus is hanging on the cross, and in the final moments, this is what happens. So in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49, this is what happens in the last moments of Jesus alive before being resurrected. By this time, it was about noon, noon on Friday. So that's why we call it Good Friday, because Jesus died for us. There's not a lot of good that happened beside that, which is a huge good. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the woman who had had followed from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. So Jesus is on the cross in those final minutes before he dies. Something crazy happens. In the temple, the holy place where Jews would have worshipped, where Jesus would have taught, where Jesus would have worshipped, there was a massive curtain. Okay, This curtain was 60 feet long by 20 feet wide, and it was about the palm thick. So take your hand, go like that. That's how thick that curtain was. And moments before Jesus died, that curtain was torn. Now, here's what's important about that. When people would go to the temple and worship, they'd see this giant curtain, and no one was allowed behind the curtain 
except the high priest only on one day of, of the year. That was when the priest would go back behind the curtain, and behind the curtain was what they called the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, things that were extremely holy, um, that were extremely close to God. And that curtain represented uh, humankind's sin. It represented our sin that separated us from God. So behind the curtain you had God, you had the blocking of the curtain, and then you had us. So when Jesus died, this thing that blocked us from getting to God was somehow torn in half. 60 feet high, 20 feet wide, the thickness of your palm, torn in half from the top down. When Jesus died, God tore that curtain in half saying that there's no more of this stuff in between me and you. I want a personal relationship with you, and I'm showing you by ripping this thing that has kept us apart. And after that, Jesus breathed his last and said, Father, into your hands I condemn my spirit, and he died. Now the story doesn't end there, right? We know that on Easter Sunday he rose, but that's a, a sermon for another day. This walk with Christ to the cross is, I, you know, it's something that I have taught many, many, many years because I think it's so powerful. And we didn't, we barely scratched the surface on, on the stuff that we could have today. But I wanted to get a couple main points across to you about this whole journey. The first is I hope you understand, especially by that, that, that tearing of the curtain in the temple. You know, we talk about it every single week, but God wants a personal relationship with you. And there's absolutely nothing in this world that can stop that from happening. Jesus, when dying on the cross, took care of that. He ripped that curtain in half. He died for our sins, the stuff that gets in the way between us and God, and said, that stuff is gone. I want you. I want a personal relationship with you. And the second thing that I hope you see during this journey with Jesus to the cross is that you were worth every painful minute of Jesus' journey for him. Let me give you an example of this. Yesterday, we went to Target and got some groceries. We got, you know, we got a family of six here. Uh, we just moved into our new house, and we also picked up our dog. So really, we've got a family of seven. My dog's huge. And we needed some groceries. So we go to Target, and we get some groceries. And at the end of it, the bill came to like 150 bucks, right? Because there's a lot of us and we need to eat, right? And so I, I, I paid the bill, paid 150 bucks, got home. Now, when I got home with those $150 worth of groceries, I just didn't take all my groceries and throw them in the garbage. I didn't take my groceries and leave them out in the car for weeks to rotten and we could never use again. I took all those groceries out of the car. I put them in the fridge. I put them in the cupboards. I put them where they needed to go. Because I had paid the price for those groceries because I wanted those groceries and I need those groceries. I just didn't chuck them or throw them away. I paid my hard-earned money for those groceries. And I want them. Guys, Jesus paid the ultimate price for you. Some of you out there really need to hear that. Some of you out there struggle with self-worth because the world outside of you and unfortunately maybe some friends or even family members have made you feel worthless. But sometimes the world and stuff that's out there can make you feel that you're worthless or, or, or that you're, you know, you know, I think of Sheldon's testimony a couple weeks ago where he was just in a, in a dark place thinking that he wasn't worth living anymore. Guys, Jesus paid the ultimate Price went through probably the most pain that any single human being on planet earth has ever gone through for you. Why? Because you're worth it. Because you are worth every step he took to the cross. You are worth every whip hit that he took to the back. You are worth every swing of the hammer that nailed him to the cross. You are worth it. And we have a God that desperately wants you to know him and have a personal relationship with him. Guys, I love this curriculum because it reminds me that that's the kind of God that we have. It reminds me that in my darkest hours, God paid the price. And God does not pay the price for us just to meanly throw us away or leave us somewhere or throw us in the garbage. He pays the price 
so that he can walk through this life with us. And not only that, but we can walk through eternity with him. Guys, I'm going to pray for us, and I, I hope that you guys have a good discussion group. And I do. I hope that you guys check out our services online next week because we'll kind of go more into the story and you'll hear more about the story. And especially Easter Sunday, because the story doesn't end with Jesus dying. The, 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 the story continues in a major way with his resurrection and thousands of people, same people that were there at the cross seeing him die, saw him walk around and continue to teach. But let me pray for, pray for us, and I hope you have a great discussion. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today. Lord, thank you that you have paid the price for each and every single one of us because you think we're worth it. Lord God, you think that we are worth dying for. Lord, I pray for those of us who really need to hear that message. Hear it, not just hear it, but believe it with all their heart. Lord, I pray over their small groups as they meet. I pray for discussion. I pray for openness and honesty. But Lord, I pray more that you just make yourself known in our life in a major way this week. Lord, I pray for Holy Week as well, that these students come on out and, and, and watch these services and get to know the story a little bit more and get to hear other people's testimonies about how you have worked in their life. Lord, bless each and every leader. Bless each and every student. Be with us during this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Guys, thanks a lot. Know that I'm praying for you. I love you guys. I miss you guys. I look forward to the point where we can come together and worship live together. Uh, and just do ministry together. But man, this is working well. Thank you for your participation. And I look forward to seeing you guys in a couple weeks. God bless.